we're going to cover some more late 1700s and early 1800s thought about Negro inferiority in this video. And one thing to understand is that it's very important to cover as many of these accounts as possible to face it head on, right? With the outcome of becoming numb and disconnected from the hyper emotional effects that this history can cause people who don't approach it from a certain perspective, right? And so this is part of the shadow work and the shadow work is required for mending the mind, modifying the consciousness and eventually moving on. And so this is why we're dealing in depth with some of these uncomfortable pain points. And so let's deal with it. Now, today we're going to be reading from the book called The Black Image in the White Mind, The Debate on Afro-American Character and Destiny, 1817 to 1914. Think about that title for a second. Now, this book was originally published in 1971 and was written by Harvard graduate and historian Dr. George M. Fredrickson. And Dr. Fredrickson was one of the many who identified as white who went to the South to support the civil rights movement. And he also protested against apartheid in South Africa. So that's just a little short background on the author. Now, let's go in here and let's turn to page one where he writes this. In the years immediately before and after 1800, white Americans often revealed by their words and actions that they viewed Negroes as a permanently alien and unassimilable element of the population. We're hearing about the growth of the seeds that the English colonists planted in the 1600s. They planted certain ideas as part of the foundation within their society. And at this point in the 1800s, a large part of the white Southern society had advanced those ideas and now they're seeing those who they call Negro as a permanently alien element of the population, as Dr. Fredrickson stated. Now, let's keep reading on. Yet articulate whites of that period were characteristically unable and perhaps even unwilling to defend their anti-Negro predispositions by presenting anything that resembled a scientific or philosophical case for the innate moral and intellectual inferiority of the black race. In the 1780s, Thomas Jefferson, alone among the spokesmen for the American Enlightenment, had moved in this direction by arguing that blacks were probably inferior to whites in certain basic qualities. But he conceded that all the facts were not available and that final judgment on the question ought to be suspended. Here we go with Jefferson again. And you'll notice that multiple authors bring up Jefferson when addressing this topic of race and slavery during this time period. And that's because he was a prominent figure and he was very influential. And when he spoke or wrote, people listened. And here's one of the examples of what he wrote that many people listened to. The opinion that they, the blacks, are inferior in the faculties of reason and imagination must be hazarded with great diffidence. This opinion must be taken with a great deal of caution and uncertainty. This is what he's saying. I advance it, therefore, as a suspicion only, that the blacks, whether originally a distinct race, or made distinct by time and circumstances, are inferior to whites, both in body and mind. Let's understand what he's saying here. Jefferson is saying that his inference is not firmly grounded and is based on his suspicion. What suspicion? That blacks are inferior to whites in both mind and body. Now let's hear it again. I advance it, therefore, as a suspicion only, that the blacks, whether originally a distinct race, or made distinct by time and circumstances, are inferior to whites, both in body and mind. Notice he said whether originally a distinct race or made distinct over time, they are inferior to whites. And why does he make this point? Because it deals with the debate whether the environment or nature caused them to be what he perceived as inferior. And Jefferson is stating that he doesn't know which of these is correct. But regardless, his suspicion is that they are, in his present time, inferior to whites. Let's hear the quote one more time. I advance it, therefore, as a suspicion only, that the blacks, whether originally a distinct race or made distinct by time and circumstances, are inferior to whites, both in body and mind. You see that? Now let's keep reading. In the words of Winthrop Jordan, Until well into the 19th century, Jefferson's judgment on that matter, with all its confused tentativeness, stood as the strongest suggestion of inferiority expressed by any Native American. 
And that's another reason why the authors repeatedly quote Jefferson, because he was one of the few intellectuals at that time that publicly voiced an opinion on the subject, right? And his suspicion did not land upon deaf ears. Let's keep going. American racial prejudice had, of course, manifested itself in various forms as a concomitant of slavery since the 17th century, which began with the English colonists. But racism, defined here as a rationalized ideology grounded in what were thought to be the facts of nature, would remain in an embryonic stage until almost the middle of the 19th century. But using pseudoscientific methods to justify racial hierarchies would remain in its early stage of development until almost the middle of the 1800s. That's what this is referring to. And Jefferson, he was a major indirect influence on setting the stage for science to become involved in this quest to prove Negro inferiority. And this is due to the statement that he made earlier and other statements where he said that it should be left to science, right? Let's read on now. For the environmentalism that was characteristic of Enlightenment thinking about human differences persisted even after the campaign against slavery it had helped create during the revolutionary era had lost most of its momentum. In one sense, it can be said the environmentalist philosophy was beginning to erode by 1810. Environmentalism at this time considers climate, geography, and societal conditions as the primary factors that determine how people look, think and behave and their thinking and behavior and even the way they look could be modified if they were placed in a different environment uh, as opposed to being strictly biological or innate and fixed. Right. And so Dr. Fredrickson is stating that the environmentalist explanation was fading by 1810, which leaves the biological or natural explanation reigning supreme. Right. Now, let's keep reading. By then, increasing doubts were being expressed about the naive 18th century theory that Differences in pigmentation were a comparatively short range result of climate and other environmental factors. He's talking about naive theories claiming that the brown skin of those who they called black could be made lighter in a relatively short period if they dwelt in a different climate. And this here was another part of the philosophy of environmentalism that people were beginning to doubt. Right. Let's keep going. What Winthrop Jordan sees as an end to environmentalism. In the period 1800 to 1812 was actually a gradual undermining of what he elsewhere more accurately describes as an extremely environmentalist posture, one which ascribed differences in skin color to the immediate effects of climate, state of society, and manner of living. The belief that black mental, moral, and psychological characteristics were the result of environment was not effectively challenged in this period and persisted as a respectable ethnological doctrine until the 1830s and 1840s. Ethnological doctrine refers to the theories about the characteristics, both physical and behavioral, of different groups. So environmentalism is one way to understand group characteristics, and so is biological. And so Dr. Fredrickson is stating that environmentalism was seen as a respectable explanation until the 1830s and 1840s, when biological explanations began to take its place. Here we go. For its full growth, the biological explanation's full growth, intellectual and ideological racism, required a body of scientific and cultural thought, which would give credence to the notion that the blacks were, for unalterable reasons of race, morally and intellectually inferior to whites. To make their claims super sticky, it needed the backing of science. They already used up all the religious explanations with it being God-ordained, and the curse of Ham, son, Canaan, and those didn't hit anymore. Science became the new tool on the block where they can use it to justify the ideas that they already had about racial hierarchies. And one of the ideas was that blacks were morally and intellectually inferior to the whites. Now let's keep going. Let's see some more. And more importantly, it required a historical context which would make such an ideology seem necessary for the effective defense of Negro slavery or other forms of white supremacy. Although gradual emancipation had been instituted in the North, slavery in the South had survived the revolutionary era and the rise of the natural rights philosophy without an elaborated racial defense, with no intellectual defense of any kind, for the institution had never actually been seriously threatened. We touched on this in the last video in Dr. Audrey Smedley's book, how slavery in the South didn't have many written defenses 
until the end of the 18th century. And that's because it was just part of the regular consciousness in that society. And it was something that they viewed as acceptable in the eyes of the Lord. And so everyone believed it and was okay with it. So there wasn't much to defend. Anti-slavery forces had been so weak and hesitant in the post-revolutionary South that emancipation proposals had not even come up for full public consideration, even though there was little difficulty at the time in gaining theoretical assent from many slaveholders to the abstract proposition that slavery was an undesirable institution which posed a threat to Republican government, national unity, and economic progress. The difficulty of turning such beliefs into action came not only from the obvious reluctance of slaveholders to give up the immediate economic and social rewards of bondage, but also from the growing awareness, even among those most strongly opposed to slavery as an institution, of the power of white prejudices and the likelihood that freed blacks would run up against barriers to equality which would inevitably make them a dangerous and degraded pariah class. They didn't want to give up the money it provided as an institution, and neither did they want to give up the white high that it offered as a social benefit. And on top of that, they figured that the blacks would never be given equal rights and equal opportunities, and because of that, they would become a dangerous and degraded outcast in society. Let's keep going. A recognition that most whites had an emotional antipathy to the idea of black and white equality as well as forebodings that blacks would emerge from slavery with moral faculties benumbed and with vengeful attitudes toward whites that would be exacerbated by the new and more competitive situation, had led Jefferson and many others to deny the feasibility and safety of emancipating large numbers of blacks on the soil, although they speculated on the possibility of avoiding race war by eventually combining emancipation with the colonization of blacks outside the United States. And we'll stop here and we'll pick up with the colonization or the thought of moving blacks outside of America in the next video. And hopefully this video here has been valuable. I thank you for watching all the way into the end. My name is Brooklyn St. Michael and I'll see you in the free world.